Hi, good morning. Really excited. Happy Halloween. We are here. Uh, we are wrapping up our special needs law awareness month and sharing information, sharing resources, sharing other professionals in the community that uh, also have a passion for helping families with members who have special needs, whether those are young children or adult children, sisters, brothers, moms and dads. Um, this community is supported by a group of professionals, and one of those professionals is here with me today, really excited. <laughs> Marcy Millard is joining me. Uh, Marcy is uh, an attorney in our community up here in North Atlanta, in the North Fulton community. Her office is located in Alpharetta, Georgia, and she is a family law attorney. And Marcy, I would love it if you could introduce yourself today. So, my name is Marcy Millard. I um, have a law firm just around the corner, and I've been practicing solely family law for about 11 years. Um, so, given the length of time, obviously, we've um, handled a lot of different issues. Uh, of course, one of them being special needs children. I also have a special needs child myself, so on top of having the experience in the family law arena, I also just have the day-to-day -day personal experience of the um, things that you need to be aware of, the stressors, the, everything that comes with having a special needs child. Um, Amy had asked me today to talk about a few things that come up in the family law arena relating to special needs children. And the, the biggest thing, the one that um, sticks out the most is the fact that Georgia law ends child support at the um, time they graduate, the kids graduate high school, regardless of any other factors. Um, so if you wanted to extend child support for a special needs child, you have to, that has to be by an agreement, or you have to craft other solutions to deal with um, the issues that arise. Um, a lot of times people will um, either set certain things in place. So the parties will agree to pay certain medical expenses for sometimes for life. They'll agree to be partially responsible for um, maybe a facility that the child would have to go to or a caretaker that the child's always going to need or things like that. And sometimes um, clients will take a part of the marital estate and set it aside, especially for the child or children. And typically the parent who's been in charge of the money or um, just handling the day-to-day -day with regard to the child is the one that will be in charge of money. But it, there are rules that we put in place that talk about how that money is to be handled. And sometimes we set it up through a special needs trust or a supplemental mm -hmm. trust or something like that. And um, a lot of times we'll put some of the basic parameters of what we're looking for. So the, this amount of money would be set aside for the child to be spent on medical expenses, living expenses, that kind of thing. And then someone like Amy would come in and handle the rest of, uh, you know, like putting in the actual trust in place. So I'm going to stop right there because I want to kind of jump back a little. Um, so traditionally in a, a marriage that is ending and going, you know, transitioning through divorce without this additional, you know, um, idea of there's a child with special needs, you know, the, the support, child support would be shared by each parent and then the parent who doesn't have the child would pay the parent that has the child, the custodial parent, um, their portion of child support, which ends, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, which ends traditionally around 18, depending if they're you know, a young senior in high school or maybe an old senior in high school. But sometimes families who have children with special needs, those children, um, they actually will graduate high school later. Correct. So let's talk a little bit about that space and then also jumping into the space of when a child reaches the age of 18, certain things change in the relationship between a parent and child and a child who doesn't have special needs. Right. But what about with a child with special needs? So first, as far as child support goes, the way the law reads is you are 
required to pay child support until the child turns 18 or graduates high school um, in any event no later than 20. So that would come into play for a special needs child because typically they're not going to graduate graduate high school at 18 or shortly after. They're going to remain in high school, so you'll be able to keep that child support in place until they're 20. But, um, I mean, as you know, with a special needs child, a lot of times they don't become an adult or independent. Sometimes at all, but sometimes it just takes much longer to get to that point. So um, we do try to account for that. And some of the things that you might want to address that not everybody thinks to address would be maybe a guardianship and how that's going to be handled or who's going to be the guardian. Or a lot of times what we've done is uh, when there's a dispute. So a lot of times it's not uncommon to say, you know, whoever's been handling it up to this point will be the guardian. The parties mm -hmm. agree to that. But sometimes there's a dispute just because there's a dispute or because both parents have been handling it. So we might say they're co-guardians and these are the rules in place or there there's one guardian and the other parent still gets to be involved in decisions relating to X, Y, Z. And this is how they resolve things going forward. But unless you put it in that agreement at the time of the divorce, it makes it much more difficult to resolve it going forward. So we do try to think of as many of the issues as possible with regard to special needs so we can put them in the agreement while everybody's dealing with everything at the same time. So if you say have a husband and wife, they're working through um, a divorce and they're negotiating all these other things, like the obvious thing that's in front of them, which right now is the money, right? Many times in a divorce, that's sort of a center, you know, a centerpiece of what's happening. Um, the child's only 10. You actually try to get the parents to sit down and think, hey, this child is not gonna be 10 forever. Their child's going to reach the age of majority, which in the state of Georgia, right, will allow them to be legally independent of you and you won't have that legal um, ability to make decisions for them and you're going to have to think now about hey this is this is coming and so rather than just finish the divorce wrap it up and try not to create you know more obstacles to finalizing the divorce which many times is what you know I hear so from some of my families you know you really try to tackle that while they're still sitting at the table Right. Because so, if they wait until that child is of the age or about to reach that age, there could be potentially more issues take longer to resolve. Right. Well, um, so as divorce attorneys, probably most attorneys, we're really good at the what if game. So we mm -hmm. try, we have to plan ahead for kids and for retirement and all sorts of other things just in general going forward. Um, but as far as, um, as far as uh, planning for the future goes, you know, we just want to make sure that we address all of the issues that we can think of. So the what if game we play, <laughs> we play a lot and try and plan as far in the future as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about um, something that I see quite a bit when I'm working with families um, or a woman who's transitioned through divorce, the divorce is final. And they um, they have through the divorce agreement two or three different things that I as an estate planner want to work through, and that is insurance requirements in place for um, for either the non-custodial parent or her, you know her herself as the custodial parent, and it usually ends when the child is 18. So if there's a special needs child in the family, is that typically addressed then when you're working with the family? Right. So, um, well, first to back up a little bit, if the parties agree to something, they, it's done. Like the court will enforce it if they agree to it um, and it becomes a binding agreement. So in other words, you can agree that child support would continue. And the court will enforce that. And if you agree that the child support will continue, mm -hmm. you're stuck with it. You cannot change it again unless the parties agree. So that's another thing you need to 
um, be mindful of whether it's a special needs child or not. You can agree to extend child support, but if you do, make sure you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as insurance goes, um, you can, you, uh, and the same token, you can agree to extend insurance. And that one's pretty common. We do that for special needs child or child, <laughs> children or not, uh, because you can keep them on your insurance until you're 26. So, you know, a lot of parents want to make sure that they um, continue to provide that benefit. What about life insurance, though? Because that's a very common provision that I will see. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it's a little boilerplate, which in legal words, that just means that, you know, maybe it wasn't the most well thought out and it was just a cut and paste move. Um, I'm imagining that you really try to think through that in life insurance requirement and not using those kinds of provisions um, for families, most especially with special needs children. Correct. Um, so a lot of times with special needs kids, like I said, you'll want to set up a trust or something else. So mm -hmm. we would draft the life insurance mm -hmm. to be paid into that or, you know, maybe half and half if there are two kids or something along those lines. But I guess uh, thanks to Amy and lots of other Will's attorneys that I've known <laughs> for years, we have um, we make sure not to keep that boilerplate language in there because yeah. you have explained how that is such a pain to try <laughs> and fix is to go back and undo so yeah, yeah. <laughs> well and I think it's a wonderful provision boilerplate or not let's let's be real it's a wonderful provision to make sure that children are taken care of um, and I think now more and more you know the relationships between estate planners and family law attorneys have really benefited and even vice versa other things that you know I become aware of with just from family law attorneys I change what I'm doing but I find that to be really uniquely um, an issue when I'm working with the mom who's previously transi transitioned through divorce and that agreement is final um, and I'm working through setting up a special needs trust or, you know, depending really um, on the circumstances, you know, working with a family member, you know, who's, who's trying to adjust their estate planning for another family member who has special needs. And so that's really wonderful. Well, can you think of anything else that we didn't talk about yet? I'm sure that there are many others that come up because right. families are unique um, and, you know, families with special needs children, you know, they, they have very unique um, opportunities in divorce to work through issues. Can you think of anything that I haven't hit on that may be a common occurrence? Um, maybe not as common, but um, special needs kids with regard to educational issues. So yeah, a lot of times you will have special needs children going through the public school system, which can be <laughs> tackled in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, but in that, there may be certain payments for services or certain um, things that you're fighting for to get from the school. And so, for instance, let's say that the school can't provide some type of, um, not in-home, some type of treatment that would require the child to go to a facility. And because of that, they have to pay for those um, expenses to go to that facility. I mean, a lot of times the agreement is crafted with the school where, you know, payments are made a certain way, but sometimes if the payment is made to the um, parties and they have to, you know, provide proof to the school that they've spent it for XYZ, mm -hmm. you might want one person in charge of that over the other, or at the very least address it somehow so they don't have an argument that the school's now involved of this person submitting mm -hmm. that receipt or whatever. So that might be something that you want to make sure to include. And the biggest thing really is if you can address it in the divorce, especially when it comes to the money side relating to the kids, it's becoming much more common to put set money aside, whether it's for a trust or not, set money aside for the kids. And if you wait and don't do that in the divorce, then you don't have that money set aside. You have to try and figure it out at the time. It might already have been spent. It might be they can't agree now. So it is really important to make sure that's put into the agreement. This is really great information, and I really hope that you've enjoyed that, uh, the information that we've shared. Um, you know, just really important, if you know somebody who needs to hear some of these messages, you know, um, 
and they are either already transitioned through divorce and maybe need to make some modifications or if you know they are you know just having thoughts that it's not working out um, and that they you know may be looking at getting a divorce in the future you know definitely share this video and this information with them if they have a child with special needs whether or not that child is uh, young or old, you know an older adult child it's really important to address these things properly during the divorce it's just really clear talking to marcy that it's a much uh you know i wouldn't say the word easier but it's it's really much more important to just you know when the divorce is happening rather than try to modify later um, and if you have questions drop them in the comments and we'll make sure that uh, if it's something that we can answer about special needs trusts and working with family law attorneys um, or if it's something that Marcy can answer, we'll make sure that uh, she sees the comments and that if she can answer it, she can. Um, how would somebody get a hold of your office uh, if they wanted to make a consultation and if they wanted to come and see your team? So the easiest way would be to contact the office. The phone number is 678-319-9500. But if you want to get more actual information about the firm before you contact us, you can go to our website, which is um, www.themillardlawfirm.com. So it's T H E M I L L A R D lawfirm.com. Yeah, and I always want to spell Marcy's last name with an I <laughs> in it after the L. So it's M I L L A R D. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know why I want to do that, but I always do. And so I just want to be clear in case someone else is tempted. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Such helpful information, and I was really excited that, one, we were able to make this happen because we were scheduling yeah. things, um, and two, we were able to make it happen on the last day of October, which is our month where we celebrate special needs law, and so we were able to make that happen for you and wrap up the month uh, with a wonderful guest. Thank you for joining us, Marcy, and uh, again, if you have questions, just drop them in the comments below.